Good morning. If you would take your Bibles and open them up to Deuteronomy. We're in Deuteronomy chapter 6, the second section of Deuteronomy, where first section looking back, second section looking up. We have a tremendous passage in front of us today, Deuteronomy 6, which is in some places called the Shema. A Shema is a Hebrew word meaning here. And so this is typically called the passage of hear and obey. In most Jewish communities, even some uh, Orthodox communities today, this is still spoken every morning and every night. And we'll see why that is. We'll see in this text how much of what God had commanded Israel to do, to, to have a walk with him, internalized personal relationship with God, turned into just outward traditions and rituals. Um, and we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about the danger of that in our own lives. And so uh, this text, Deuteronomy 6, is quoted a few times in the New Testament by Jesus himself um, and really is the cornerstone for all of the new covenant in loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the outcome would be that you would love your neighbor as yourself. This type of love is not new. If you'll remember in John chapter 13, verse 33 and 34, where Jesus says, well, let's go there real quick. John chapter 13. John 13. Uh, in John 13, look with me at the, verse 34. He says, Jesus is speaking, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. That's not new. We're, we're going to see that all the way through the Old Testament. We're going to see that laid out. It's not new that we should love one another. What's new is, even as I have loved you. The example of perfect love. Uh, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The only thing that will enable me to love someone else, truly agape love is love for God. And we're gonna talk about that from our text in Deuteronomy 6. So if you have not already uh, read chapter six, read it, study it. We're gonna talk about the Trinity. We're gonna talk about some deep things and uh, we're gonna have some fun doing it. So uh, we're gonna dive in you stop this video though, read it for yourselves, put the work in, and then we'll fellowship and we'll see how God is bringing us together by his spirit through the word. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for another day. We thank you as the sunshine comes through the windows and as the seasons change, we are reminded that there are seasons in our lives and may we know what season we're in and may every season be a great opportunity to commune with you, to know you better. And then as we leave the word today, that we're going to go out and may your word be implanted in us so that when we come across people, we would have your heart, your perspective, uh, your will would be done in our lives today, just like it's done in heaven. So Father, we desperately need you today to guide us. Make things clear, and may then we have the heart to accept what you uh, show us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We begin chapter 6, verse 1. Now this is the commandment. Now, we just last chapter went through the Decalogue, 10 commandments. But here he says, he's summing all of it up into one. If this one command is obeyed, all of the other commands will flow out in obedience. If I love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, 
I will not have other gods before me. I will not make graven images. I won't use God's name in vain. I will uh, observe the Sabbath. I will honor my parents. I won't murder. I won't commit adultery. I won't lie. Um, I won't steal. I won't covet what my neighbor has. These are all the outgrowth of loving God. Now, we went through yesterday how every one of us have broken every one of these commands, the heart of the command. And so it gets to the point that we have to say this, the reason I break the command is because I don't love God like I should. And so that is sin. I must confess that is sin. I want to repent of that sin. And I want to grow in my love for God today. Uh, love is a choice, not a feeling. The world wants to put forth that love is this idea that you can't control. It just kind of comes on you and you fall into it. And, and, and sometimes you feel it, sometimes whatever. Love is a choice. We talk often of this definition of love and the definition of hate. I think it's very simple and it will help stick in your mind. Love is, I will deny me for you. That is love. Hate in direct opposition to love, hate will be, I will deny you for me. So think through that just in a simple way what love and hate will be. Uh, many people get married. They say they're getting married based on love, but really they're getting married based on hate because they think that marrying this person, this person is going to do something for them. It'll never work. Now, this is the commandment. This, this sums up, the com this is the commandment, the statutes, the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you. Um, Moses is saying, I don't have a choice. Like, like Paul stated in, in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, he says, Paul said, I'm under compulsion to preach the gospel, meaning I can't not preach it. Uh, did it cost him? Well, yeah, you can go to Acts 4, uh, 18 through 20, and you can see what it cost Paul. Uh, to preach the gospel. Did it cost Moses? You better believe the last 40 years of his life have been difficult. But he's carrying it out. Even though he's not going to be able to go into the promised land, he's still, I'm going to finish the course that God has put before me. Um, that they would do them in the land where they're going over to possess it. Remember, this isn't about Moses. He could be upset because he's not going to be able to go in. But what he does want is the generation that is going in to be successful. And the only way they're going to be successful is through obedience. He says, so that you may, that you and your sons and your grandsons might, number one, fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes, his commandments, which I commanded you all the days of your life that your days may be prolonged. God said, this is the covenant at Sinai that I'm making with you. He gave them the Decalogue. Um, if they love God, they would keep these. But what we're going to find out is there was no way that they could love God within their own human flesh, all on their own. This is an unmitigated disaster. The, the law and Paul makes this clear in Galatians. Nobody could keep the law. Jesus fulfilled the law because he was perfect. He is God in our human flesh, no way possible. And so the law is to show us, and the example of Israel is to show us that I can't obey God. I can't love God on my own. I need a savior. I need a substitute. And I don't need a Savior to come in and make me better. I need a Savior that can make me, who is dead to God, alive to him. I need not reformation. I need regeneration. I need to be born again. Verse 3. O Israel, you should listen. Be careful to do. 
Think of this. This is the same pattern for us as disciples today. I've got to be in the word, listening to the word, and then be willing to go out and obey the word. Now, we have the benefit of having being born again, having the power of the Holy Spirit in us to uh, help us uh, to carry these out. And uh, they, they didn't have that. It says, be careful to do it, that you may dwell, it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Then he says, here, that's the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. So remember those words. The Yahweh is your Elohim. Yahweh is your Elohim. Elohim being the plural name of God. Im, anytime you see Im on a Hebrew word, it's the plural. Elohim, but it's talking about the transcendence of God. The omnipotence, the power of God, the greatness of God. But the word Yahweh is the covenant name of God. The close, imminent relationship with Almighty God. Both together is a wonderful picture. But it says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is, the, the Lord is one. Now, as we read this, Israel today, Jews today, still have a problem. They would say that this verse alone disqualifies the whole New Testament from being from God. This disqualifies Jesus from being God. Okay? Uh, th th and they, they get adamant. There's one. And even uh, in Islam, the same idea that God is one. And this idea of God being three uh, persons in one God is very difficult. I want to take this moment to try to help lend some light. I won't be so pompous as to think I can explain the Trinity to you, but there are some things that can help in this argument. This is a Hebrew confession of faith in Yahweh. There's one God, okay, one. Um, but there are, in the Hebrew language, there are two words used as one. One is a compound unity. One is a singular unity. And ichad is this word for compound unity. Uh, yahid is the singular unity. Now, let's talk about that and let's show some examples of this. Here, the word one is this compound unity. Um, it could be translated this way. You shall love the Lord. Uh, no, the Lord is our God. The Lord alone is God, is one. Alone. There's no other God. Okay, um, It could be translated that way. Let's look at a couple other texts that use this, and then we'll look at some that use uh, the singular unity. Go with me to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. In verse 5, it says this, uh, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. There was evening, there was morning, one day. The one there is a compound unity. The one is morning, evening. Okay, so there's aspects in one. Keep that in mind. Compound unity. Go to chapter 2, verse 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. One flesh there meaning husband, wife. Compound unity. Let's go to another. Uh, go to Exodus 26. Exodus 26. 
Look at verse 6. It says this. You shall make, it's talking about the tabernacle, you shall make 50 clasps of gold that hold the curtains up and join the curtains to one another with the clasp so that the tabernacle will be a unit. It's the same word. So that the tabernacle will be one. Okay, so many clasps hooking everything together, making one tabernacle. Um, look at Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I think it is worth making. Uh, Ezekiel 37. Look at verse 17. It says this. Then join them for yourselves, one to another, into one stick, uh, that they may become one in your hand. Again, he's, we won't go into all the context of what's going on here, but it's talking about different parts being put together, compound unity. Now, let's look at some verses about the singular unity, and then we'll look at one that has both in it. Uh, go to Psalm 25 with me. Right in the middle of your Bible, Psalm 25. In verse 16, it says this. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Lonely, uh, alone, this, this is the word here, all by himself. I am lonely and afflicted. Singular unity. Okay? Different word than is used in Deuteronomy 6 to describe God. The, the word described in Deuteronomy 6 is the compound unity, many parts making one, which is totally consistent with one God who reveals himself in three persons. One other uh, text. Go with me to Genesis 22, where uh, Abraham is asked to sacrifice his son Isaac, Genesis 22. And this is a cool verse because it has both of these Hebrew terms in it. It says, Abraham, uh, he said, take now your only son. That's singular unity. He's only got one son. Whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. That one is compound unity. It's one peak that's in a mountain range. Okay, so all that being said is I want you to, to be able to discern the difference in the Hebrew language between singular unity and compound unity and be able to explain this to people. There's answers to these problems that people have um, and we can talk to them uh, in a real way. Go to verse five of Deuteronomy six. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your might. Now we'll, we'll get to the love part, but what is your heart? What is your soul? Um, might is your physical being. Jesus turned that into and used it as your mind. So I think we understand the might or the mind. Uh, what is my soul? Well, I take things into my mind and I process them. And I process them and I make decisions based on what I think. Um, that is my soul. I can make real choices. Um, my soul then, though, leads into, as I make choices every day, turns into my heart. My priorities come from my individual choices. So we could call it habits. We could call it that. My priorities aren't necessarily something that I can just change. See, the process of changing my priorities is first I have to change the way I think then the way I think has to change the decisions that I make, and then my priorities will of necessity change. It says, you shall love the Lord your God uh, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. 
Uh, what does it mean to love God? Uh, Jesus, you can go to Matthew 22, 37 through 38, where he says, he's asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he says, it's this, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Um, and the outcome of that will be that you will be able to love your neighbor as yourself. Let's, let's look at a couple texts about this. Go to John 14. John 14 in verse 15 says this. If you what? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, this is exactly what he told Israel, but they could not keep the commandments because in and of their flesh, it's impossible. What I need is rebirth and the power of the Holy Spirit to come in me to dwell not in a tabernacle, but in my body to give me the power to be able to keep these commands. Go to Romans. Well, we can read it. We can just say uh, Romans 5, 8 says God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, so the idea is that he initiated love with me. I must then respond to that love uh, and love him back, uh, which uh, 1 John 4, 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. Um, but not go to 1 John. Let's, there's a couple other that we need to read in there. 1 John uh, chapter 4. 1 John 4, look at verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Uh, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world. Into the world. Um, go back to John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, says this. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay our lives down for the brethren. Um, in Deuteronomy, we're getting this, what is developed by Jesus even more, and the apostles even more, is the root of this. Well, I'm supposed to love God. Deuteronomy states it like this. To love God means that I'm going to seek him back in chapter four, uh, verse 29, it says, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all uh, my commandments, uh, that it may be well with them. Um, I'm sorry, it's verse 27. Go near, that's chapter five, I'm in the wrong one. Chapter four, uh, verse 29 says, but from there you will seek the Lord your God. And, and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and with all your soul. So to love God is to seek God. Uh, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews put it this way in Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must first believe that he is and that he rewards those who seek him. So I ask you this morning, are you seeking God? Second aspect of Deuteronomy, what does it mean to love God, is from chapter 10, verse 12, where he puts it this, Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So I'm going to seek him, and then from the seeking him, I'm going to serve him. And then from serving him, look, go to chapter 11, verse 18. He says this, uh, You shall therefore impress these words of mine on your heart and on your soul. You shall bind them as a sign on your hands that they may be frontals uh, on your forehead. Um, what? The word of God in me. I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. If I love God, I'm going to seek him. 
I'm going to serve him. His word is going to be implanted in me. These are the things that we can even apply today. Do I love God? Well, am I seeking him? From seeking him, am I serving him? Is his word part of me? We go on to verse 6. It says, these words which I have commanded you today shall be on your heart. And then he goes in to this awesome example of Moses is teaching them. And then he wants them to turn around and teach their children and grandchildren and generationally uh, instruction. This really is what is missing today. Somehow parents have bought into the fact, especially fathers, that it's, it's <clears throat> the pastor's job or some the youth pastor's job to teach their children. It's the father's job to teach the children. Uh, the power there. God has given the authority. Look what it says. You shall teach them diligently. The word diligently. Don't let me slack get in the rope. Teach them diligently to your sons. Talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. This is the idea where they would, they would recite this in the morning. Recite this in the afternoon, in the evening, or they would go to bed. Uh, but the idea here is, is they're taking it very, very literal. But the idea is that you would be speaking of God and his word. <clears throat> it's in us. We would be speaking of it all the time in every different situation. He goes on and he tells them this. Uh, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as a frontal on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So first, when he's talking about bind them on your hand and on your head, they took this literally made little leather boxes and little tiny copies of the, of the scriptures and put it in the box. What he's saying is implant this in your mind. When you're using your hands, make aware of God's word being uh, implanted all and enforced all day long. It, I love the idea of if you walk through this house, in every room we have scripture on the walls. Uh, if uh, I remember when I, Sean and I were first married, I... Uh, had a job where I had to go in and, and spray for pest control. And so many times I would have a key to different apartments and houses and I would just go in when nobody was there. And I didn't know the residents, and, but you can walk through their house and what's on the wall and you can get, a, get an idea of who these people are. And some houses you would go in and they would have scripture on the walls and you know, man, these people love Jesus and they want other people to know it. Um, what Israel did was even these bind them on the signs of your hand and they should be frontals on your forehead. These, they turned into what's called phylacteries, little boxes, and they would hang them. Um, now, the, the religious leaders made bigger and bigger phylacteries to, to show people that they were carrying around more of Scripture. And Jesus talks about this in uh, Matthew 23, the first five verses or six verses, where he's uh, rebuking the religious leaders because everything they're doing, they're doing to be seen by people. They turn everything into an outward display rather than an inward relationship. But there's also a connection with this Satan is always trying to copy what God wants. And so in Revelation 13, let's go there. Revelation 13. Revelation, very last book of the Bible, 13. Uh, look at verse 16. It says this. And he causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free man and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand and on their forehead. Um, again, copying the Shema, God wants his word, his word on our forehead, on our hands, so that everything we think and everything that we do would be guided by him. 
Satan comes along and puts the mark of, instead of the mark of God on the forehead and on the hand, the mark of man. Um, most believe that it is the numbers, it is right here, 666, six, six, which is the mark of man. The mark of God would be 777, seven, seven, but we won't get into all that um, because it's not really that important. Um, be careful about getting uh, somebody else's name other than God put on your forehead or on your hand. Uh, this should uh, cause us some warning. Uh, look at verse 10. Then it shall come about when you, when the Lord your God brings you into the house. I love that. He promised Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and he's going to do it. He's going to bring you into great and splendid cities, which you did not build, houses full of goods, which you did not fill, hewn wells or cisterns, which you did not dig, vineyards, olive trees, which you did not plant. And you're going to eat and be satisfied. No, none of that's wrong. But when you eat and you get satisfied, sometimes you forget who provided all this. It says, watch yourselves that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall fear only the Lord your God. You shall worship him and swear by his name. A couple things. First, swear by his name. I thought we weren't supposed to swear. Don't use God's name in vain. Okay, Matthew 5, 33 through 37, you can read about the misuse of this. But in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13, even the Lord swears by his own name. Okay, so there is a correct way to use God's name, and there is a profane way to use God's name. So make sure you're aware. It's not as if we uh, never want to uh, use God's name. But in this, there is the idea or danger. There's a danger that we don't often think about. We may talk about it in theory, but we don't really chew on this enough. The danger of success and prosperity. The danger of success and prosperity. We may give it a, a wink and a nod, but ultimately we want success and prosperity. And so we don't think about the danger of it. Um, I want you, I'm going to take you to Luke chapter six. Um, Jesus is speaking and he's giving the sermon on the plain and he's giving the Beatitudes. Um, blessed, blessings and curse. He, he says blessed and woes here. And it's interesting that what he says is a blessing is directly the opposite of what we would call a blessing. Let me read. He says in verse 20, turning his gaze towards his disciples, he began to say, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you, insult you and scorn you. Uh, your name as evil for the sake of the son of man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy for behold, your reward is great in heaven for in the same way, their fathers used to treat the prophets. Then he says, woe to you when you are rich for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe are you who are well fed now for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophet the same way. So let's just take that and let's say, wait a minute. Woo, that's exactly the opposite of what I naturally think is a blessing and a curse. What's Jesus getting at? The whole idea is if in this life, my whole uh purpose is to seek God, to get to know God, and then to glorify him going out into the world, making his name great. But the, the, the mere fact of it is the more that I have, the more comfort I have, the more I'm surrounded by frivolity and, and fun, the more I'm distracted away from the reality of getting to know God. When I am going through difficult times is generally when I seek God and call out to God. And so keep this in mind. He says, when you get in the land and you get successful, know that there's, you're, you're going to have a tendency to 
forget. It's interesting in verse 13, uh, you shall fear only the Lord your God and you shall worship him. Jesus quotes in Matthew 4, uh, 8 through 10, when he's being tempted by Satan. And Satan is showing him all the kingdoms of the world, uh, which he has dominion over. How did Satan get dominion over the world? When Adam, God gave Adam dominion over the world, and when Adam sinned, Satan took control, at least within limits that God places on him. So Satan is telling Jesus, which Jesus is going to take back dominion uh, through his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, but Satan is offering him all of this without going through death, burial, and resurrection. All he's got to do is worship Satan. Um, <laughs> the only problem is the greatest burden, the anguish that Jesus felt wasn't the death on the cross. It was separation from the Father. And so this would have separated him from the Father anyway. And he, so Jesus, in response to the lust of the eyes, you know, Eve and Adam clearly gave in to lust of the eyes. They saw the fruit that it was pretty. It was pleasant to the eyes. They gave in. Jesus has seen all the riches of the whole world, yet says, I'm not going to worship Satan. And he quotes this scripture. He goes on uh, in another uh, verse 16, it says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus also quotes this, when Jesus is being tempted by the pride of life. When Adam and Eve were tempted by pride of life, the, Eve saw that the fruit was going to make her wise. She gave into the temptation. Jesus is being tempted by Satan and Satan actually quotes, misquotes, or omits parts of Scripture. So he misuses Scripture when he's talking about the Son. And he tells Jesus, you're so important to God the Father that you can jump off the highest part of the temple and God won't allow you to splat on the ground. He will send angels to bear you up. So why don't you go up there and prove it? Prove that God, you're so important to, to God the Father that he won't allow you to even hurt yourself. And well, we know Jesus quotes this scripture that says this, uh, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. God tests us, we don't test him. And therefore, he withstood uh, the temptation of the pride of life. Jesus did not need affirmation of his father's approval. He had just gotten it in chapter 3 of Matthew when he's baptized by John the Baptist. And God the Father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So we go down it says, you shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. So see the difference. Here he's saying commandments. Verse one, he said commandment. Not confusing. If I want to keep the commandments, I must first keep the commandment. The, the enabling commandment is that if I love God with all my heart, soul, and might, then the outgrowth of that will be obedience in all the other areas. When I'm having trouble obeying, obeying in the individual areas, it's because I don't love God like I should. This is where the confession and repentance needs to come in. Now remember, um, verse eight, let's look at verse 18. It says, you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you and that you may go in and possess the good land. So the parameters of the covenant at Sinai were, God has given you certain commands and you'll be blessed if you obey. If you disobey, God is going to curse you. Now, much confusion comes from this where people take this and put this onto the new covenant. 
When I talk about the new covenant, remember, there are seven covenants in the Bible. We've got the eternal covenant between the Father and the Son. You can read about that in Hebrews 13. But Jesus, in, in, in uh, John chapter 1, Jesus is right there in the beginning with God the Father and God the Spirit. Okay, so we've got the eternal covenant. We've got the covenant with Adam. The covenant with Adam is, if you don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I'm going to come and be with you. The covenant which he broke. We go on to the next covenant, which is the covenant with Noah, that he would never flood the earth again. Go forward to Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15. God makes a covenant with Abram, who later becomes Abraham, that he's going to make a great nation from him. All the nations of the world will be blessed through him. That is through Messiah, who would come from the nation. Uh, then we have this Sinai covenant. This covenant is based on works. This covenant was given just to show us, show Israel and everyone else, our inability to obey God in and of our fleshly nature. There are two more covenants. We have the covenant with David, King David, that uh, somebody from the line of David will sit on the throne for eternity. That is also fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And then we have what we read yesterday from Jeremiah 23, the new covenant, which was brought into reality through the incarnation, through Jesus Christ. Under the new covenant, the source of blessing is not uh, done through works. It's done through obedience by faith. Now, all of them were saved in the Old Testament by grace through faith because nobody could keep this. This was just to show them how broken they are. And Romans, the book of Romans does a real good job of showing that nobody was regenerated by the law. The law brings death. Jesus brings life. Salvation in, under the old covenant came by looking forward to Messiah coming not by keeping rules. Now, to keep this covenant, this covenant was not connected with their eternity. This covenant was connected with their ability to inhabit the land. If they obeyed God, they would stay in the land. But through Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we know that people who were taken into captivity, taken out of the land, they could still love God. They just, the, the covenant with Sinai was focused on land. So try to make sure you keep that straight in your own uh, understanding. Under the new covenant, go to Romans chapter 8 with me. We'll just look at a couple verses. Romans chapter 8. Um, the idea of the new covenant is being in Christ. That everything is fulfilled. The law is fulfilled in Christ. I am in Christ. I am justified. I have a new standing before God the Father because of Jesus Christ. I'm in Christ. But now that I'm in Christ, the Spirit of God is in me, changing me to make me look more like Christ. So it's by grace through faith. Chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is what he's talking about, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh so that, what? The requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Boy, we could just go through that whole text of, of Romans 8, and it is a blessing all the way through. But let's finish the Shema. Go to verse 20. When your sons ask you, okay, kids, Ask questions. God wants you to have answers. Teach, instruct your children. In Ephesians chapter 6, dads, Paul 
under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit urges us is, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but raise them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Discipline. When they're young, this is spanking them. Uh, when they're getting older, this is using different other ways of getting their attention, never to be done in anger. I get their attention. Discipline is never the aim. The discipline is to get their attention for the purpose of then, while you have their intention, you can instruct them. You can show them that what they did was wrong and why it was wrong according to God's standard. And then how to move forward to do what is right to please God. The focus has always got to be on God, not on us, and should never, ever, ever be done in anger. Children need two things, and I think as we look at ourselves as children of God, we still need these two things. We need to, children need to know that someone's going to love them no matter what they do. And two, children need boundaries that aren't going to move. In Christ, we have all of these so that we can grow and get to know God. When your son asks you in a time to come, saying, what do the testimonies and the statutes and the judges mean which the Lord your God commanded you? Remember, there are all these sacrifices and festivals, and they're going to be asking questions, and you should give them answers. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us from Egypt with a mighty hand. Now, the ones he's talking to probably weren't even born at that point, or if they were, they were just small children. God did this. Verse 24, so the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival, as it is today. It will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all this commandments before the Lord our God. This is the faith aspect. Righteousness is only in Christ. He's the only one that is righteous. The New Testament talks of practicing righteousness. First John, first three chapters talk of this often. Practicing righteousness, getting to know God and working through the ups and the downs of this. I pray that today uh, you will be practicing righteousness. You say, well, why is it important? I'll leave you with one verse from 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. It says this, By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Everyone who's a child of God it says practices righteousness and loves their brother. Examine our lives today to make sure we're in the faith. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that the clarity that your spirit alone can bring to us. Now, now that we've heard, Father, by your spirit, by your power, help us to go out and obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Peace.